All right, class, so here we are back at it. What we're going to do is jump right in talking about analysis of variance. So this is abbreviated ANOVA, and it's really just kind of a minor extension of what we've already learned, which is the t-test. So we learned about the t-tests, and although we had a one-sample t-test, which kind of transitioned us from the z-test we had learned into the t-test, right? We also learned about two new types of t-tests, which allowed us to actually compare groups against one another instead of to compare some number from a sample against some expected value in a population. So now we can compare groups against each other. Now we learned about this in terms of the independent sample t-test which allowed us to compare two separate groups boys versus girls drawn at random from the world try to compare them on something, right? We learned about the related samples or paired samples t-test which allowed us to do either a match pairs or a repeated measures type design and to compare two groups of scores that were somehow connected to one another. So for example, they came from the same person before and after a weight loss intervention. Or they came from two siblings living in the same home to compare the use of internet of brothers versus sisters. But every brother and sister were paired up, right? And so the question is about the that kind of paired relationship difference. So we learned about these ideas and we're now going to jump into ANOVA. Now, although there are forms of ANOVA for both the independent type designs and the related type designs, we are going to focus in this class on the independent type design only. So what that means is we're going to focus on what is often called a between subjects analysis of variance. You can also think of it as an independent sample analysis of variance. The basic requirement going to be that we have groups that are not related to one another. Okay, so ANOVA. Let's start talking about this. We're going to start with the history. And the first thing to realize is that ANOVA is rooted in the history of experimentation, just like the t-test was. Uh, the ANOVA was developed to do something the t-test could not do, which is compare more than two groups at a time. So if you remember the independent sample t-test, we love that idea that we could say grab grab a bunch of people who have depression or some disease that we want to treat with some new drug or treatment, randomly assign to a placebo control and an intervention treatment, and with that random assignment we can assume independence of groups now as long as there's no contamination somehow during the study, and now we can compare the average you know, depression in the people who had the treatment and the average depression in people who had placebo and see whether there's a significant difference, which we would then infer was the result of our treatment. Now, we can only handle two groups here. What if you wanted to do three groups? What if you wanted to do four groups? What if you wanted to do five groups, right? And the thing is, ANOVA can handle essentially as many groups as you would like, which is a nice advantage beyond the t-test. Now you can still do an ANOVA if you only have two groups and in fact the we'll find out that the t-value and the f-value have a statement of equality. So t-squared is going to equal f when you only have two groups. But the ANOVA gives us more ability. So it was developed kind of like the t-test in this agricultural history of trying to improve productivity. Uh, Sir Ronald Fisher knighted, he was a mathematician, statistician, uh, this guy made some amazing contributions to, to, to statistics, including developing the analysis of variance as a way to look at differences uh, in designs like what are sometimes called split plot designs, where you can have, you know, take a, splot, a, a piece of land and break it into multiple groups to compare instead of just two groups. So the ANOVA is rooted in this same kind of idea of manipulating something, right? When you manipulate something, you inherently create groups, right? You can't manipulate things on a continuum. If I'm going to randomly assign, I can't randomly assign you to an infinity possible number of scores, right? A continuity, a continuum. Uh, so when I randomly assign, I have to randomly assign two groups, which inherently makes the independent variable categorical, which means you've got things like t-tests and f-tests, the ANOVA will use the f-test, that are useful here. And they'll look at these between group differences on something that we measure on a scale, on a continuum, for them to get an average to compare the group averages. So we could say, does this plot of land have an average yield greater than this plot of land and this plot of land, right? This type of approach. All right, so this is the idea 
Um, there are some assumptions in all tests, and most of the assumptions are going to have to do with the distribution of errors following it. Now, for the sake of our class, we're not going to beat this to death too much, but we're assuming that our errors are normally distributed, right? So the errors are normally independently and identically distributed with some mean of zero and some specified variance. So we assume that there is normal distribution of the errors. That is, after we predict the score for a given person in a group, if we take all of the ways that we mispredicted for an entire group and we plot them, they should look about normal. You can do these types of um, assessments actually pretty simply with JASP. We're not going to worry too much about it right now, but they are important to realize that all statistical tests come with some set of assumptions. Now, in general, they tend to be fairly robust to violations, but you can change the answers you get if you violate the assumptions and still use the test that requires them. Identic identicality is often tested with what's called homogeneity of variance. Uh, this is the idea that the variances of the groups are equal, um, and the variances of their errors are equal, and independent distributions, that is that the errors in one group are not related to the errors in another group. Um, this is an important thing as well. So we want to meet these three requirements of normality, identicality, and independence in the distribution of the error terms. So what is it that we're testing? Well, the hypothesis statement could be written very much so like a hypothesis statement would be written for a t-test. And that is essentially you can think of it as testing means. Now, technically, what we'll see, the math is using variances in it, but it's really testing the group averages. So if you get a significant difference, it means that the average for one group is going to be higher than the average for another group, etc. So you could think about this as the possibility of testing multiple means now, right? So the mean for group one equals the mean for group two equals the mean for group three equals the mean for group J, where J just stands in for whatever number of groups you have, whether it be six, seven, twelve. So the null hypothesis is that all these groups are equal and their averages are equal. The alternate here is going to be that the groups have different means, right? So there are differences somewhere in, in the means of these groups. And this looks very much so like what we saw. If you just left it as mean 1 equals mean 2, mean 1 does not equal mean 2, that basically looks like an independent sample t-test, right? That, that statement could be tested with that. So we are still thinking, you know, testing this statement. The null says the groups are equal, right? The means are equal for the groups. The alternate says the means are not equal for the groups. And that's what we're going to test using the F test. So the F is the actual statistic that the ANOVA, the analysis of variance, uses. And again, it's called an analysis of variance because, as we'll see, we're essentially looking at the variances in the actual math. And so the F distribution is the shape that this will take because it is modeling variances. And variances can't be negative because they're squared. So the F distribution has a minimum value of zero, and zeros in and of themselves would be rare. But a minimum value of zero, larger values are rare, and it's going to be positively skewed because there is a floor here at zero. You can't get less than that number. So this F distribution will change shapes. As you notice here, there's plots of several different shapes. They're all positively skewed. They all don't go anywhere below zero. But you see that each of them is defined by now two different degree of freedom terms. There's a degree of freedom in the numerator, and there's a degree of freedom in the denominator for every F test. So the T test, we only had one degree of freedom term we worried about. And the reason for that is because there was only two groups. So now we're going to have to take into account the number of groups that we have, which is going to affect degrees of freedom, and the total number of people we have, which is going to affect degrees of freedom. In, in all of our T tests, we never could have more than two groups, so we really only worried about the number of people. But now we have to worry about the number of groups and the number of people, because both of those can be different, and both of those affect the degrees of freedom. The number of groups is going to primarily, it's, it's going to affect both, but you're going to see the effect of the number of groups principally in the numerator, degree of freedom, um, and you're going to see the kind of person effect in the denominator, the residual. So you have kind of the between groups in the numerator, and you have kind of the within groups in the denominator. Okay, so let's take a look at some of this. So characteristics, again, it's going to be positively skewed. It's going to have a minimum of zero. And the important thing for our significance test is that a larger F value, greater than zero, the bigger it gets, the rarer it's going to be here on this distribution in general. And what that means is those are going to be the values that we are more concerned with. Larger Fs are going to be what yield P values that are surprising to us, that is statistically significant. 
So again, the actual math, what is it doing? Well, let's look at the big picture first, and then we'll get into the nitty gritty of how we calculate these pieces in the big picture. So big picture, it is basically a signal to noise ratio, really. When it all boils away, in the numerator, you're saying, how much of the variance can you explain? And this is saying, if I know what group you belong to, how much of the variance in difference, so people differ, right? That's variance, people differ. There is variability in their measurements. So if I'm measuring height or weight or GPA or IQ, people are gonna have different values. There's gonna be variance in the scores. Now the question is, can I explain some of the variance in the scores? My hypothesis for the F-test is that knowing what group you belong to will predict something. It will explain variance, right? So if I know you're a boy, or if I know you're a girl, if I know you're a psych major, a business major, or a finance major, these things are going to predict something, right? So maybe if I know your major, I can better predict your GPA. And if that's the case, then this numerator term is going to say I can account for variance by knowing the group you belong to. I can better predict your GPA if I know you're a psych major, a nursing major, or a journalism major, then if I just say, well, you go to school, right? So the numerator is looking at what the groups can do in terms of accounting for variance. And the denominator is going to say, well, but there's a bunch of variance even within the groups, right? Not all psych majors have the same GPA. Not all journalism majors have the same GPA. So the GPAs are still going to vary within the groups. So is what I am explaining between the groups important enough given the amount of variability that actually exists even within those groups, right? I got to think about both of these things to understand how worthwhile knowing the group membership is for predicting the effects, right? Explaining the variance. So the accounted variance is in the numerator. The unaccounted variance is in the denominator. And this is basically our signal to noise ratio that we get for our F statistic. So the ways that we calculate this, if we think about it, the big picture look is that we're going to take sum of squares. Everybody remembers sum of squares. We learned this earlier. It has never gone away, right? It's a very important thing when we deal with many traditional mathematical approaches that deal with continuous data, right? Interval ratio scale. Um, sum of squares is a very important measure that we use for dispersion because it's what allows us to get to variance and it's what allows us to get to standard deviation and all those important things, which is what we need for many of these tests. We need to know about those differences and how well we can explain them. So we have the sum of squares here that is between the groups, right? So this is how much difference we can explain between the groups and we need to then get a degree of freedom between the groups. Okay, then we're going to talk about these degree of freedom terms here. And then we have a sum of squares that is within groups. So this is within each group. There's still variance. How much is that? And how many units go into that variance, which is the degrees of freedom within the groups. So if we think about these things, the between degrees of freedom are going to come from our group numbers because it's about our groups. So you have to compare the hypotheses here. So the degrees of freedom between are going to be a function of the number of groups we have. Now in your book, I think they use the letter K. I often use the letter J. We'll use K in other places. I don't really care as long as you understand. Right now, this symbolism we're using is about groups. Okay, so if we use K like the book, okay, we have K number of groups right? And in our alternate hypothesis, right? So the alternate hypothesis, H sub A, says that we need K means in order to explain the, predict the values effectively, right? Because every group is different. Our hypothesis, right? If you think back to our hypothesis statements, the null says all the groups are equal for their means, and the alternate says all the groups aren't equal for their means. So the alternate says every group needs its own mean, so I need k means. But the null hypothesis says all the groups are equal. And if all the groups are equal, I only need one mean. That's it, because they're all the same. So I don't need, I need, just need one. That's it. So the degrees of freedom here is going to come from the difference in how many more estimates you'd have to make for groups if the alternate is true.
So this term is always going to be here, the number of groups you have, which we'll symbolize here with k, minus 1. For a between subjects analysis of variance, the numerator degree of freedom is the number of groups minus 1. Here we'll symbolize as k minus 1. Okay, now the denominator degree of freedom has to do with all of the people within the groups. And it has to do with how all those people still differ, even if you know their groups. So this one is going to say, well, remember, how many degrees of freedom do I kind of have left? And this goes back to the same logic that was there for the independent sample t-test when we got its degrees of freedom. We had to say, how many estimates did we make? And we take away that number of estimates from the total sample size. Because doing that leaves the number of free to vary cases. Right? Once I make predictions, I lock scores in place. We did demonstrations with this looking at the fact that if I get four people's scores and I calculate the mean and then I lose somebody's score, if I know the mean, I can backtrack using algebra to get the one missing score Right? because it only can be one number now. Right? So once we calculate that mean, which we have to do to get some of squares, once we calculate a mean, we lock a score in that sample in place, essentially. It's no longer free to vary. All the other scores are free to vary, right? So this is the principle here. Now, what's going on is if I do, in fact, say every group gets its own mean, then I'm calculating four different variance terms using those four different means if I have four groups. So for example, if we here have a k equals four, I have four different values that I need to calculate for means. So say that I had four groups and I have a sample size. Now in your book I think here for the total sample size it uses capital N. I don't like that because I think of that as population. Which most people do. Often what I will use in notation here is I'll use N lowercase for the entire sample and I'll use N sub K or J which means the number per group. So if we're using K for group if we do N sub K that means the number of people in a given group. So say here I have four groups and I have a sample size of 100. Then if the groups are all even, my NK, my number per group, is going to be 25. Right? And so here I have four groups, 100 total subjects, 25 people per group. 4 times 25 is 100, my entire sample size, right? In the numerator, I would have 4 minus 1 degree of freedom, which would be 3. In the denominator, I would say, okay, if I'm going to make all the predictions that each group gets its own mean, how many free to vary cases do I have for all the differences within people, right? This person is different than that person. So this is the difference between groups. This is the difference between people. So this is how many groups are free to vary. This is how many people. And so here I would have the number of people, n, total number of people, 100, minus the number of groups, 4. So just as k minus 1 is the numerator degree of freedom here, we can think of the denominator degree of freedom as n, minus k. Now people use different notation for this. I'm pretty sure your book here uses k, so I'm trying to be consistent with that. So those are the degree of freedom terms. Now we've already learned about sum of squares, but I'm going to take you through calculating all of these new sum of squares, okay? So don't worry about that too much right now, but I want to nail down this degree of freedom concept. So number of groups minus one is the numerator degree of freedom. So if you have five groups, you've got four degrees of freedom. Number of people minus number of groups is your denominator degree of freedom. So if you've got 100 people in five groups, you've got 95 degrees of freedom in the denominator. So that's how you're going to get those terms. Now, when you take the sum of squares and you divide by these terms, what you're going to end up with, you have mean squares between over mean squares within. That's what people often call this in ANOVA. Essentially, a mean square error is a variance. So some people write this as a variance between groups and a variance within groups. So this is the important idea here. This is what the F-test is doing. It's saying how much variance is between groups, how much variance is within groups.
If you get a big F number, it means there's a lot of variance between groups compared to within groups. So that tells us that groups are really useful in explaining variance, right? If you get a really small F value, it means that there's a lot more variance between people than there is, or between people than there is between groups or within people. So the people all differ so much here, the groups don't seem to help much compared to that, right? So that's what we're really asking is, do the groups carry a lot of predictive bang for the buck, right? Do they explain enough variance to be really worthwhile? Okay, so that's the idea that we're dealing with here. Now, oh, out of order, here we go. So if we talk about this, the degrees of freedom, if you think about this in terms of the hypothesis statements, you have the number of parameters that you're going to estimate in your alternate minus the number of parameters you're going to estimate in your null. And if you remember, what that comes down to is that the number of parameters in your alternate model, right, under HA is always going to be K, which is the number of groups because every group is different according to your alternate hypothesis, right? Alternate, right? Under the null hypothesis, every group is the same, so you're only going to have one. So this is what gives us our k minus one. The denominator to df is going to come from your total sample size, big N used in your book for total sample size here, so I've used that notation. Again, if I use little n and I use little n sub j or sub k, okay, but Please understand that. Okay, so here, if you think about the total number of cases minus the parameters in the alternate, which is going to be k, the number of groups, right? That is going to be your denominator degree of freedom, right? And so those are how we get our degrees of freedom, and they all go back to our hypothesis statements, right? And then the total degrees of freedom for the entire thing would have n minus 1, which sounds very much so like a t-test. And that's because if all the groups are the same, and you only have to make one estimate, right, if the null is true, the total number of degrees of freedom you could have would be n minus the 1 you have to still estimate for the null. 1 mean for all the groups, right? Okay, 1 variance for all the groups. Okay, so hopefully that helps clarify that a bit. Now let's look at, this is the notation your book uses to kind of quickly summarize how to get these different sum of squares. So we have the sum of squares between, within, and total. Okay, now doing these by hand is probably never really worth it in our class. Let's just be honest, right? So you can do these quickly in Excel. Of course, this is all done as part of JASP calculations, but if you need to get sum of squares, Excel can make it pretty simple. And we can do it in the subparts, or we can do it in a kind of a one quick, fast process, but there are commands for these things in Excel. So if I bring over some Excel data, and we think about how do we get these sum of squares and what are they reflecting, let's take a look. So here I've got data that describes three different groups. Let's see if we're going to do it this way. All right, so here I've got data for three groups. And for these three groups, they have sets of 10 scores. So each group has 10 people in it. So if we think about the things we've learned already, what can we already know? Just looking at this data, what can we already know in terms of our ANOVA model? Well, we know that N, we'll use big N like your book would, we know that n, which here I'm referring to all the people in the study, would be 30. We know that n per group, because it's evenly divided, is 10, right? So we already know these things. We already know k. How many groups are there? Three. Okay, so we already know all those things. Knowing those things, we can already get our df terms. So if we think about df, our df in the numerator we already said is always going to be k minus 1. Here k is 3, so we get 2. Okay. We know our denominator, degree of freedom, dfd, degrees of freedom in the denominator, is always n minus k. So here we have 30 minus 3, 27. So we know that we're going to have an f test with what we would write as 2 and 27 degrees of freedom. You always write the numerator and then the denominator term, right? If you think about how you read English, you read from top to bottom and left to right. So in the numerator, it's first, so it goes on the left. The denominator is bottom, so it's second, so it goes on the right. Top to bottom, left to right. Okay, so that would be our degrees of freedom. We've already established that, okay? No problem. 
Now, what we need, don't know for our F test is what about the sum of squares? Where do these sum of squares terms come from? Well, if you remember, there's an easy way to get sum of squares. And if you look here in Excel, that is, there's an easy way, right? I mean, this math, it's not that hard, but it's probably not worth your time. I want you to understand the principle, though. Okay. So between, within, and total. Well, what is total sum of squares? Total sum of squares is literally just the sum of squares for all 30 numbers. So in Excel, there was this command called du square, which returns the sum of squares. If I want to get the total sum of squares, all I have to do is select the entire set of data. This is my sum of squares total. There it is. All right. So sum of squares total, I'm going to make an extra row here so I have some more room to work. Sum of squares total right there below. Now what about the other one? Sum of squares between, sum of squares within. Now one nice truth is that the sum of squares between and within, when you add them together, have to be the sum of squares total. And that's kind of an important principle. It also means once you find two numbers, you can always find the last one. So we don't need to calculate all three of these separately. We just need to get two. Once we have two, we can solve for the last using simple subtraction addition. All right, so let's look at how we can solve for these. So we already got total. We only need to get one more. I think that if you're going to do this in Excel, the simplest way to do this is to do the within. The within is really basically doing what we already know for sum of squares. What is sum of squares? Sum of squares is where you take a score, subtract the mean, that's the deviation. You square that deviation, then you add that up for the entire group, right? That is the sum of the squared deviations. So we would, you know, find the mean for group one. We would subtract eight minus the mean, eight minus the mean, three minus the mean, five minus the mean. We would do that all the way down. We would square all those values. We would add those all together. That's the sum of squares for the group, right? When we got the sum of squares total, we would have done the mean for all 30 people, subtract each of the mean from all 30 scores, square all those, add those all together. So we already learned about how to do sum of squares. Hopefully you remember, at least somewhat familiar with that process. So when you do within groups, you just have to do that exact same process for all three, all four, however many groups there are, and then add them together. That's the sum of squares within each group. So if I do div square here, and I just reference my sample my group one data right so here's group one and now if I come over here and I do the div square for group two and then I come over here and I do the div square for group three Here is the sum of squares for each group. If I sum those, so now I'm just summing all these totals. This is the sum of squares within. All right, now to get the between, it's really easy. I mean, I could do that extra math, but I already have two of them. Why don't I just subtract? If I do total minus within, I will get between because between plus within is total. The differences between the groups, the differences within the groups, that's all the differences there are. There's nothing else. So when I add between and within, I get total. And so here are my three sum of squares terms. So now if I wanted to finish and do my F test, my F test is going to be sum of squares between is the numerator minus degrees of freedom in the numerator, or divided by, excuse me, degrees of freedom in the numerator, which we already said was two, right? We did that over here divided by sum of squares within divided by degrees of freedom denominator which we said was 27. So this is going to yield an F statistic. So there's my F. Now we can get the P value in here as well kind of doing this process by hand if you want to. You can do the F distribution F dot dis dot right tail and you can put in the value of F and the degrees of freedom numerator, degrees of freedom denominator, right? So this is our F with 2 and 27, and you get the p-value. So here we have 
our F results from these groups. And these are statistically significant. So this says there are significant differences in the averages for these groups. So you probably want to know, well, what are the averages for these groups? So you can do the average for group one, the average for group two, and the average for group three. And so if we look at this, what we're seeing is group three seems to have a notably different average, right? So this is mean one, mean two, mean three. So it looks like group three has a significantly higher mean than the other two groups, but the other two groups don't look that different. Now this highlights something that we're gonna have to review, which is we have multiple groups we're testing. How do we know which ones differ from the others when we just get a significant test that says, well, there are differences between the groups, right? We're gonna look at how to do that. But so if you're not sure that you trust all this process, I'm just gonna do a quick check. So I'm gonna use the data analysis function and do a single factor ANOVA in Excel. And I'm gonna use my data from my table. So here's my table data selected, A1 to C11, which is where my data are located. I have labels, group names in the first row. So I've checked that box. And I'm gonna just make a new worksheet. Well, you know what, let's just put it right on this same page so we can see it all at once. So I'm gonna stick it right here. Okay, and so here's what we get. So here we see the averages. Well, those are the averages that we just calculated. Beautiful, all right, we're on track. Let's look at some of the other stuff. The total sum of squares should be, ah, it is the same. The within group sum of squares, the same. The between group sum of squares, the same. The degree of freedom terms, correct. The mean squares, we didn't calculate on the way, but the mean square is simply the sum of squares divided by the DF, right? We just did that all in this one equation, which gives us the F test matches and the P value, which matches. So here is what we call an F table. This is an F table. It, it's gonna have your between group, within group, and your total line. The nice thing about the F table is all the numbers in it you can get from one another quite simply, which you're gonna have to do on some of your homework. So it's worth looking quickly to see how these values relate to one another. So I'm gonna move this F table over. Well, we'll just zoom in on it here. All right, so when we look at this F table, I wanna highlight a couple important relationships in these. So first, the between group and the within group, sum of squares, we already identified. I'm gonna make this larger, we can read it all. We already identified them, when we add those together, we get the total. So what you find out is that between group here plus within group is gonna equal total. So if we take this number and we add this number, it's gonna equal this number. Well, that's also true for other terms in the table, degrees of freedom. When we take the between group degree of freedom and we add the within group, we get the total degree of freedom. So that means if any of these were missing, I can calculate the missing value from what is there, right? How do we get from these things to these things? All right, so let's look at the other relationships in this table. Well, when you take the sum of squares and you divide by the degrees of freedom, that gets you the mean square. There you go. And that's true on both of these lines. So when I do this divided by this, I get this. So 296 divided by 27 is about 11, right? 268 divided by 2, 134. Hopefully you can see that math. So you can again find any missing values here by using algebra, right? So this also means, you know, if you think about this the other way, that if you were to multiply mean square multiplied by df, that's going to get you to backtrack for going this way to sum of squares, because sum of squares divided by df is ms, so ms multiplied by df is sum of squares. Just simple algebraic reversal there, right? And that's true again for both of these. How do we get the f ratio? Well, the f ratio is simply the mean square between divided by the mean square within. So when we do this division, that equals this F value, right? So when we look at all these values here in what we call an F table, it is actually really simple to calculate missing values from the values that already are there. So you could have a lot of this missing and still solve for any of those missing values with the information available.
And a lot of times the easiest way to start is to start with degree of freedom. Try to fill all these out. Because remember, if you know the sample size, you know how many people were in your study, or you know the number of people that are in each group, right, which can be n or n sub k. Uh, and if you know the number of groups, if you know those things. So if someone says, I had a study with 100 people um, and 25 people per group, right? Then you know you had n was 100, and you know nk was 25, right? And then you know that this must be 4. Once you know all those things, you can find that all these df terms, which is what we practiced uh, just a second ago on this video, when we started this problem here, and I just said, hey, we've got three groups, 30 people, let's find all this information, right? And we were able to find all of this information. So you can go back through some of that if you need to, to revisit and refresh. But here is a demonstration of these principles. And if we look at how they relate to these equations, these will make some sense to us. So here, this sum of squares within, so the sum of squares total is the, is these are the, the expedient calculations, but what is this doing? It is simply the sum of squares for all the data that exists. It's the total, right? The sum of squares within is the sum of the deviation scores around the mean within each group, hence the sub j notation here. So it's not to be confusing. It's just because now you have to do this math within each group, and then you have to add all of those together after you've done them for each group, right? And then the between we can get once we've got those two other values, but here it's a function of the group total. So this is a group total squared, and this is the grand grand total squared is the notation your book uses. So this is the total for it single, single groups. This is the total for all the data. Uh, you divide by the numbers, right? And then you sum all those. And that would be a way to calculate this between if you did it first. But I think that, again, it's really worthwhile to realize it's worth just kind of doing that one last because it's simple to do the other ones in Excel rather than try to like spend the time writing these all out. Again, it's not that the math is really that crazy, it's that there's a lot of steps, which makes it more likely that you could make a mistake somewhere, and a mistake somewhere increases, makes the answer wrong, right? So the increased probability of making a mistake, probably not worth it, as opposed to learning how to get some of these values effectively in, in your tools and understanding what they mean conceptually. So hopefully that helps a little bit with that information. Uh, and that is the idea here of the degrees of freedom and the sum of squares. So we've nailed down everything that's part of the F-test. We've shown how to compute an F-test kind of long way in Excel. And we've done a quick like check of that with the, um, the easy way in Excel. Hopefully that helps a little bit. So now we run into this problem about we have multiple means. How do we know which ones are different, right? So here we had 4.8, 4.9, and 11 something for our three groups. And it's pretty easy to say, well, that 11, that's clearly the different one, 4, 8, 4, 9. But 4, 8, and 4.9 could be different, right? It depends on how variable the groups are, right? Because, again, you're considering how much differences there are within the groups. If, if all the group people in the groups are, like, really the same, then any difference between the groups might still be meaningful. So... What we're doing for the F test is what we call an omnibus test. Omnibus basically means it carries all the passengers, right? So it tests all the groups against one another. So if you get a significant F test, all you know is all the groups aren't equal. You don't know which of the groups aren't equal. So we have to follow that up. The way we follow this up, we call specific comparisons or post hoc tests. And I'm going to demo how to do this using JASP. So it's actually very easy to do in JASP. Let me just bring over an example uh, of JASP data for doing an ANOVA. It's pretty straightforward. But so here, this is an example of what we're going to see for the lab. And here I've done, we're just going to switch this out. We're going to do pre. Okay. So here we're looking at whether or not the levels of manic symptoms differ before between the three different treatment groups we're going to look at, which are uh, a control group getting drugs, lithium for bipolar disorder or getting psychotherapy, okay? Uh, and so here, there's all these different boxes uh, and we're gonna take a look at a few of them and see that it's really easy to get the things we need. So when you run this first, you're gonna get your ANOVA table just like this, which here says this p-value is not significant, the f-value is very small. There aren't differences between um, between the treatment groups at baseline, which is actually a good thing, right? You don't want the groups to already be different when they haven't been treated. Um, it gives us the statistics here in the post hoc. So when we come down, 
you have the a contrast option. But you also have a post hoc option, and we're going to focus on using this one. So it's going to look like this when you first come in here. Nothing's going to be checked, right? Um, I think they check standard. Um, so you bring over the treatment to test the post hoc for treatment, which is going to then look at all three of the groups. Notice now that you get a T statistic, right? And the reason is because you're only comparing two things at a time now. So comparing only two things at a time here, psychotherapy to pharmacotherapy and psychotherapy to control, right? Now it also here does pharmacotherapy to control, but this is technically a somewhat redundant test because you can infer that difference from the differences here, but still what you see is none of these groups differ from any other groups, okay? Uh, you can get effect sizes uniquely for these as Cohen's D, just like you would for a t-test, and you can do corrections because now we're going to talk about you're doing a bunch of tests, right? You're not just doing one significance test. Now you did one significance test and here you're doing three more. And the more you do tests, it's like rolling it's like rolling a dice, right? And you're like, oh, I can roll a one. Well, if you say I'm gonna roll a one and you drop the dice one time and roll a one, you only had a one in six chance of getting it. That's pretty cool. Like, okay, you know, not totally shocking, but somewhat cool. But if you say I'm gonna roll a one and you just keep rolling the dice until a one comes up, like that's not impressive, right? So here's the thing. If we're just gonna keep doing tests and just kind of play with chance. The more you keep doing tests of chance, sooner or later one's going to come up right. Right? If you make a billion predictions in your life, one of your predictions has to be right. <laughs> You've made so many. Right? You can't just cherry pick those ones and go, oh, it's exciting. So we can correct for the number of tests we do by making ourselves have to meet a higher standard of probability or chance instead of just saying, oh, you know what, we're going to just use 0.05 all the time. Okay, so we can do these corrections and there are the options here. Tukey is one people often use. There are some other ones we'll talk about just briefly. Bonferroni is kind of an old classic, but it's fallen out of favor a little bit. Bonferroni is really easy to explain. So we're going to explain Bonferroni for the principle, but realize that these other methods are often used. And Tukey is one we'll kind of focus on in this class. So we can do these multiple comparisons, post hoc tests, pretty simple. Uh, and what they do are then going to compare group to group. And here we see with the corrected Tukey's, none of these are statistically significant. So not only is there no difference between all three groups, but if we look from group to group, none of those groups differ from one another. Okay, so this is a way that we're going to have to follow up our test now. So unlike the t-test where you ran one test, you got one p-value and you were done, if you get a significant result, you need to follow it up now. So two important rules. When do you need a post hoc test? You need a post hoc test if you have more than two groups and you have a significant F result. So if you get a significant result and you have more than two groups, you need to do a post hoc test because you need to tell me which of the groups are different. You can't just say there's differences somewhere, right? That's not a good answer. Okay, so super important, two rules. You need a post hoc test if you have more than two groups and a significant F test result. All right, so these basically are ways that we do one-to-one -one comparisons, and as we saw, there are several options which you can click a button for, thank you JASP, to get these results. Uh, and what they're doing is trying to do a way to compare with some type of correction, often for inflation of type 1 error, which we're going to talk about, these groups on a one-to-one -one level. You can also do what's called complex comparisons, where for example, you could compare one group to the average of other groups. Like, is this group different from those groups altogether? You can do that too. In our class, we're gonna focus on these one-to-one -one specific comparisons or post hoc tests. So again, we have this issue now where we're inflating our type one error. Uh, remember, type one error is the probability of getting all excited that you found something special uh, when it really wasn't that exciting, right? Like, oh, Eureka, and like, no. <laughs> so here's the thing, getting all excited. If I walk in and you roll a one, when you said you were going to roll a one, but it took you like seven tries, <laughs> it's not so exciting, right? So that's the thing we want to avoid here. Because we're doing multiple tests, we could find things that like look special or rare, but when you, when you, remember, we're talking about finding things that only have a one in 20 chance of happening. So if you do 20 tests, one of them is going to be significant just by chance. You don't want that. You want it to be significant because it's really telling us about something in the world, right? That there's an inference worth making here. So options, people look at, well, how do we reduce the risk of type one error? Well, you can make it more rigorous. As we noted, one of the most common and simple ones to think about is the Bonferroni correction. 
Bonferroni simply says that you take your desired alpha value. So number, remember, we normally set alpha at 0 0.05. And so if our alpha is 0 0.05, we would take this value and we would divide it by the number of comparisons we intend to make, which is abbreviated C. So if you're going to make three comparisons and you want all of them to be protected at a 0 0.05 level, you don't want more than a 1 in 20 chance of making a type 1 error, even though you did multiple tests. You would take 0 0.05, you would divide it by 3, and that would give you your new corrected rate, right? So this is a way that we can do these corrections for type 1 error that can be useful as a way to protect our overall error rates. So that would look like this. And we would say, OK, we're going to take every single test now, and we're going to compare each individual test, not to 0.05. Each individual test is going to be compared to 0 0.0167. 6, Seven rounding here to four. And so if I compare every test to this value, then that is going to be more rigorous. I'm not going to get excited if a p value is 0.04 anymore. I'm not going to get excited unless it's at least this small, right? So that's the Bonferroni approach. And it's kind of the most intuitive, straightforward. Okay, if I don't want more than a 5% chance of making an error, I just got to make sure that I use a rate for every test that when I add all those together, my rate doesn't get bigger than 0.05, right? So that's this kind of classic idea. And in one way or another, all of these type 1 error rate corrections are trying to do that. So how do you want to control for type 1 error rate? Some people never do it. Some people always do it. There's debate about it and what it's worth. But it's important to at least be clear about the decision you're making. So one option is you can say I'm going to protect if, say I'm doing a study. And within my study or my experiment, I'm going to do 15 tests. I could choose to say, for all 15 of those tests, I don't want more than a 5% chance of a type 1 error. Okay, so you can compare what we would call, you can protect what we would call an experiment-wise error rate. Now, what if you say, um, well, I've got several like kind of subtests. Like, I, I've got one group of tests that's looking at depression outcomes, and one that's looking at anxiety, and one that's looking at sociability. So I want to protect those groups of tests, not all of the tests, but those groups. That could be what we call family-wise error rate. So maybe I did five tests related to depression, five tests related to sociability, and five related to anxiety. And I protect within each of those groups at a 0.05. Right? So like if I took 0.05 and divide by 5, instead of 0.05 divide by 15, which is all of the tests, right? So if I did by 15, that would be experiment-wise. If I do five, that'd be family-wise. Now if you don't do any, you're basically doing what's called comparison-wise. Your every single test has a 5% chance of making a type 1 error. Of course, if you have a 5% chance of making a type 1 error and you do 100 tests, those all add up to where like you're about 99% sure to make a type 1 error, right? Because you keep doing that 5% gamble and sooner or later it's going to pay off. And we can do the math. I'm not going to make you do it in this class, but we can calculate that out. And so the more tests you do, the more likely it becomes that a type 1 error exists somewhere in your computations. Now, you can't know which one it is. You can't go, well, that was the p-value that was kind of on the margin. It must be the one that doesn't matter. I mean, maybe, maybe not. But this is why a lot of people just make the, make the um, expectation more rigorous for significance in correcting for error. Okay. So these are some important things to consider. We have to do these multiple comparisons or you know, uh, post hoc tests and compare things one by one, but that means more tests. So then we've got to think about the fact that we're playing the game with chance more often and we don't want to cheat. Okay. Now the last thing we want to talk about is with all of this, you're going to still want to get effect sizes because again, significance, as we just kind of hit on, has a lot of things that influence it. So we want to think about how large the effects are and practical significance as well. So effect sizes are often used for this. You can still do Cohen's D, which is basically a standardized mean difference, if you remember. So you would take like the mean for one group, subtract the mean for another group, and divide by the pooled standard deviation. So it still works. We already learned it. Um, the problem you have with Cohen's D here, so remember, you're going to take, for example, the mean for group 1. I'm just going to abbreviate with APA notation for simplicity here. Mean for group 1, and you're going to subtract the mean for group 2. 
and you're going to divide this by the pooled standard deviation. So you're going to get the standard deviation. Remember how we talked about pooled for independent sample t-test? You're going to do the pooled standard deviation. Hey, Daddy. Hey, Daddy. We can still do this Cohen's D. Now the problem you have is what is this, you know, which groups are you comparing and what is this value you're going to use? Are you going to use the pooled standard deviation for all the groups, just for the groups you're comparing? Um, are you going to compare group one to group two? Notice however many groups you have, you have to do more of these. So Cohen's D becomes much less useful here because you have to do a bunch of them. Not that you can't do it. You can still do it. You've got to have pooled variance as part of it, and you've got to think about what you're choosing to compare. If you do R squared, the R family, you can do what's called often partial eta squared in this context, which is basically R squared, um, at least right now, in the one-factor, one-way ANOVA. It's called one-way, one-factor, because there's only one independent variable, right? Um, ANOVA, we'll talk about later, can handle more than that. Sneak peek for factorial ANOVA coming next. So here we have these uh, an easy way to just get an effect size for how much group matters on a whole. Um, and it's really easy. You just take the sum of squares in the numerator, the between group, right, and divide it by the total sum of squares. And that is a semi-partial R squared, the R squared here for this effect. And it tells you uh, how much of the variance is explained between groups. So it's a great way to do an effect size here for ANOVA. It's the way I would certainly prefer in this context. So this is what you can do. Uh, and we'll quickly look at some stuff for the JASP demo. Uh, for how we can do this with JASP. So I'm gonna I'm gonna close all this, reset everything real fast because we had already had this for a quick demo. And hopefully it will help as you prepare to do your own. So if we pull up the data here, um, I'm going to want you to test something different, but I'm going to just look at, again, how do we do this whole process uh, running an ANOVA in JASP? So we have our data. We're going to go back to our data. So here's what the data look like. And we've got three different treatment groups here. So we can't use a t-test. We have psychotherapy, we have pharmacotherapy, and we have control. So our independent variable here is what kind of treatment these people received. We have males and females in the study, right? And we took the measure of the number of manic symptoms they had before the study began at baseline, at, immediately after treatment was completed, post, and then a follow-up period a year later, they measured how much manic symptoms they were still experiencing. So we have three measures here of their manic symptoms. And so here we can go run our ANOVA, and we're going to just do the ANOVA. That's all we're working with right now. When you click on ANOVA, it's going to bring you over to this area. Start all from fresh. Here we go. So you click on ANOVA, it brings you over here. The first thing we want to know is what is the dependent variable? The dependent variable is the thing that you think differs as a function of group membership. Because groups are always your factor or your independent variable in ANOVA. The independent variable in ANOVA has to be categories, as we said at the beginning of the lecture. The dependent variable has to be continuous, all right? So here, our factor is treatment. What treatment did they receive? The dependent variable, we're going to use their symptoms. Uh, we're going to use their symptoms at pre, and we're just going to go through all the process here. So here we get our table. The treatment sum of squares, the residual sum of squares, it doesn't give us the total line here. This is the numerator and denominator. So we have 2 and 42 degrees of freedom. Why? 3 minus 1 is 2. 45 minus 3 is 42. We had 45 people in the study. Here are the mean squares. You take this one and divide by this one, and you get the F and the P value. So this is not statistically significant. So there were no differences in the manic symptoms between these groups before they started treatment, which is good, because that means that if there are differences after, it wasn't because they were already different. Now we can go down here and look at some other important things. I noted that you can do some assumption tests. So for example, you can do homogeneity of variance. And here you see that that's not significant, which is good. If this were significant, it would suggest you may have violated homogeneity of variance expectations. 
Uh, you can also do, we looked at QQ plots for normality before. You can do a QQ plot, and notice this is for the residuals. You assume that the errors are normally distributed. This looks pretty darn good, right? Uh, again, we said, think about kids on a sock line. You want your dots to kind of follow this line. So that's pretty good. Okay, so that's a quick way to look at some of the assumptions. We can look at our post hoc tests. We can bring treatment over, and we can do our two-key correction. Uh, to see whether or not there are significant differences. And notice none of the groups when you compare them one to one. So here's psychotherapy versus pharmacotherapy. They're not different. Here's psychotherapy versus control. They're not different. Here's pharmacotherapy versus control. They're not different. Right? You always want to probably get descriptive statistics at least. So get the marginal means is what we call them. And that's going to be the mean by each group. So here's the means for each group. Psychotherapy, pharmacotherapy, and control. And you see that they're all pretty close. The averages and the number of manic symptoms, all pretty close. I'm also going to get here the descriptive statistics, which gives you the standard deviation and the number of people per group. Right? So notice 15 in each group is why we had 45 people. And you can also get the effect sizes like eta squared, partial eta squared. And this one is called omega squared, which is another correction. Um, we're not going to talk much about it in our class. As I said, right now, these two values are going to be the same. They're, they'll differ when we get to factorial ANOVA, but in a one-way ANOVA, eta squared and partial eta squared are the same number. So here we've explained very little variance. You can also think of this as, as R squared. Um, it's really the same difference. Uh, so there you go. So ways that you can get all of these things that we need for running a full ANOVA very quickly and easily. Here's our output, what it would look like in JASP. So when you have to do your lab, you can quickly get all these pieces. There, there are more options. There's more moving pieces. There's more stuff to do, but they're all really pretty simple to do in JASP, right? So hopefully you have a better sense of some of the issues in ANOVA, what we're trying to do with the math, what it tells us, right, about whether or not groups have different means, um, and a way to do it with a couple tools, Excel and JASP. All right, so that's it for our ANOVA part one, which is a one-way between subjects analysis of variance, right? One way, only one predictor, one factor, but there can be multiple groups for that factor. Between subjects, because the groups need to be independent, right? And you're looking for differences between those groups. And an ANOVA, because it's an analysis of the variances. The variance between groups divided by the variance within groups gives us our F statistic, which tells us whether or not group membership, whatever the independent variable or factor is, is a group membership thing, whether group membership explains a good amount of variance, significant amount of variance, right, in your outcome being measured. So hopefully that helps. We'll see you again soon here. We'll have some coming videos. We'll do labs and lectures. We'll get all those posted. Uh, I'll also, feel free to shoot me questions. I can do video responses to questions. And I sent out a survey about interests for having like office hours potentially scheduled. I'm going to do all the actual content asynchronously so that you can watch it whenever works for you. But I want to make myself available if it works for the class at reasonable times to try to be available to field questions in a, in a synchronous format so you can talk with me live still. All right. So be sure to take that poll so I can plan that effectively. And let's keep after it.